Good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Yochanan Polker and I'm co-founder and executive director of First Start. It's an honor and supposed for us to be hosting this webinar, bringing together Jews from all over the world and all different backgrounds. Uh, when Fresh Start opened a few years ago, our goal was to provide services and programming to help Claw Yisrael heal from the past. Ex experiences like childhood abuse, trauma, neglect, but today things are a little different, and the traumas in the present and the current events are causing many of us to feel anxiety, fear, and a host of other emotions and possibly behaviors we thought we may have buried a long time ago. So we hope this webinar series will help all of us and our families navigate through these difficult times. To learn more about Fresh Start, please visit our website, JewishFreshStart.com. I would like to thank our anonymous sponsor who has graciously sponsored this webinar series, Leilu Nishmas Daniel Benester, Rafael Baleo, Mary Huda Yosef Akayan, and in honor of Tzadok Leo and Eli Seligson, two true pillars of the Detroit community. Um, and now joining us today, <clears throat> we have again the Zchos to have Rabbi Shema Russell, LCSW, all the way from Yerushalayim. Uh, Rabbi Russell is co-founder, chief clinical supervisor, and senior retreat supervisor of Fresh Start. Rabbi Russell is a psychotherapist in private practice in Jerusalem. He is a popular author and speaker who has presented on many mental health related topics throughout the world. And if you haven't already done so, please buy his book, Raising a Loving Family. And um, whatever you get out of this podcast, you are going to get 100x uh, out of reading that book for you and your children. So I'll strongly encourage you. Dr. Porges, you got yourself a copy yet? Yes, I have. You uh, do? Okay. Yes, I do. All right. Good. Just making sure. Um, <laughs> and of course, Dr. Stephen Porges and, and Dr. Porges, I do want to say that, you know, I think I speak on behalf of our community that um, spending time with us this morning means the world to to us that, you know, our, our plight and uh, the current situation being addressed and being helped by, you know, experts in the mental health world like yourself uh, is really, really great, really greatly appreciated and comforting just in and of itself. But a little bit about you, for those who don't know, Dr. Porges is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, known for his development of the polyvagal theory, exploring how the autonomic nervous system influences trauma. Um, you know, I was trying to take your whole bio and I was like, you know what? Let's just let's just talk about the part that why we're here. Uh, but of course, there are many other things that Dr. Porges has done in his career. We look forward to today's discussion. I do want to say if anybody has questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the Q&A. We have a list of questions as well. Um, so we'll see where this goes. And hopefully the next hour, I'm sure, will be meaningful and insightful and, and healing. With that being said, Rabbi Russell, please uh, help us get this morning or afternoon, depending where you're at, uh, start. Sure. First of all, welcome, Dr. Borges, Steve. It's good to see you again, as always. Thank you. And really grateful to have you here. You're looking good. It's nice to see you. Um, well, we're in difficult times. We're in really unprecedented times that um, the, word, the word trauma, of course, is uh, on the lips of everyone around the world. We here in Israel, of course, experienced it firsthand, although it's very clear. I've traveled since then abroad, and I see it's everywhere, everywhere in the world. We're in touch with people in America and England all over. And um, aside from the trauma, the direct trauma here and threat of terrorism and the dangers, the physical dangers upon us that are real and present, anti-Semitism has risen again in the world. I think uh, you would attest this um, unprecedented, unexpected in the world we live, that this could have happened. And here we are again with um, fear, fear to be a Jew in the world. And there's an underlying feeling that everyone, everyone I speak to, you know, I'm trying to help everyone understand that there's no shame in acknowledging you're having a trauma reaction. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's something's off in your body. And 
I think that's, you know, a conversation. <laughs> Am I correct? Is that a great place? Yeah, for yeah I, I think we need to start by literally honoring what our body does and what it does extremely well. And that's detect uh, danger and threat. And so our bodies are reacting. And really what I want to focus on, I would like to focus on, is the fact that we're angry and we're fearful at the same time. And in many of us, we, and with both those types of emotions, we're almost shameful to experience or express them or to share them. But we're angry and we're fearful. And that's natural. That's what our body does. And for many of us, our role in life is to comfort others, you know, to, in a sense, lead them through to a path in which they feel comfortable in their own bodies. But if we're still reacting ourselves with anger and with fear, we broadcast that to everyone we go near. And this requires a special role for, for you, Rabbi, a special role for me. We're human. We're going to react. But we have another obligation. We really, we have a mission, whatever terminology we want to use, a calling, a mission, uh, a, a, a oath, a covenant we've made, and that is to make the world a better place, to en enhance humanity. And to do that, we have to be very respectful that we have a body. And that body is regulated by a nervous system. And that nervous system detects real dangers and even associated or let's say, images of danger or historical images, transgenerational trauma. And we are reacting, as, as the Jewish community around the world is reacting with all that transgenerational, we can use the term in, I, I don't mean to be dismissive, but transgenerational baggage. We don't want to react. We want to be helpful. And so my first message really is, we need to respect that we are human and there's nothing wrong with that about being angry and fearful. And we need to be self-compassionate and we need to understand that we can mitigate those feelings only through safe interactions with others. And that doesn't mean the people that we serve, but it may mean our closest colleagues, our spouses, our dearest friends, our, our students or you know, our, some of our colleagues in the world of therapy would be colleagues who are experiencing the fear and threat and understand that they have to regulate their bodies through the act of co-regulation. So the basic history of, of being a human, being a social mammal, is that we have always mitigated our threat reactions through co-regulating with another safe and trusted individual. And that means safe and trusted. It doesn't mean sitting in a room complaining and working yourself up. So we have special roles as co-regulators, and we could say lovers of humanity, but we're really our job is to mitigate the fear and anger and threat in other people's bodies. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. That's, that's a great start. Um, so co-regulation, of course, is the key to bring social engagement, to bring us back to social engagement. Would that be right? And the, here's two questions I might have for you. One is how, to, by the way, we have a, a large number of listeners from around the world, uh, people in Israel, we have people in America, probably in other countries, and we have a large number of therapists who are on now and or will be watching this, looking for skills to bring to their clients too, just to give you a context of, you know, who's going to be engaged in this. So here's, here's a couple of questions. One is, how do we know? How, do you, how does a person sense that my body's reacting? You know, no, we're not, we're not, a, you appreciate the question. We're not attuned to it well enough. Uh, and uh, we need to be more attuned. And then what do we do about that? What okay, do we do? Let's, let's break it into two parts. And yeah. the first part is like, think of ourselves as babies. You know, a baby uh, reacts or pets react. Somewhere along the line, we learned lessons not to listen to our body. We become numb to our own feelings. And there's a pragmatic aspect to that is that if we are as servants to our bodily feelings, we can't do our jobs. Now, that works fine if you're pressing a lever or you're making a piece or you're doing a part. It gets more difficult when you're in certain types of tasks like writing a sermon or writing a science paper because your mind can't be expansive and creative under those states. So you and I have a sense that we like to feel safe when we do our creative work. But sure. if you worked on the assembly line, it wouldn't matter because you could still recruit that. Our society treats humanity as if we're all on the assembly line. And so we learn 
in a sense, we truly learn to turn off feelings. And you think of this initially as voluntary reaction, but people are said, be a man, be an adult, don't cry, you know, tough it up, just go ahead, you have to do this. And over time, the nervous system is learning. Uh, you're not learning the intentional behavior of not feeling. Your nervous system is learning to become numb. And the consequence of numbing the body from its internal feelings are this array of psycho, so-called psychogenic, psychosomatic, functional disorders, medically unexplained symptoms, basically said gut problems. I just use the word gut problems because virtually all gut problems, people say, oh, it's stress. Well, what, what do you think stress is? Stress is the nervous system detecting threat. So your body is disrupted its role of taking care of you in response to threat. It's mobilized you to protect even though the threat may not be real. The, con the interesting part now, especially for those in Israel and many Jews in the U.S., the threat is becoming real. And mm -hmm. that is difficult. So we, But it, it's difficult on one level. But on another level, it creates literally the portal back into our body. When the threat is real, we can feel our body. We can acknowledge that. But the one important message is that when your body feels threat, when you start learning about it and, and sensing it, not only is your body feeling threat, you are broadcasting threat to others. Mm, and that is a great responsibility. Once you kind of understand that, you realize you have to, in a sense, not numb, but you have to contain it. And that's where the neurobiology of our history comes in. How did social mammals, how did humans mitigate their threat reactions do they yell at each other they don't feel don't do that uh, you know own up to this you got to do this no they put an arm around like they work with the baby they talk with a prosodic voice they slowed things up they calm things up i'm actually going to take you back to a luminary a famous psychologist psychotherapist victor frankel i mean mm -hmm. and i'm sure you you now as I always talk about that physiological state as being the mediator of our reactions. So when our body is in a state of threat, stimuli result in reactions. And when our body is in a state of calmness, we just kind of buffered and we deal with it. Well, Frankel actually talked about something very similar. He said somewhere between the stimulus and the response is a space. And in that space is free will. So what he's saying from polyvagal terms, that space is your reaction to the stimulus, your visceral feelings, your neuroception, but your intentional behavior is your free will. You can start feeling your body and not using that feeling as an engine to react. And I'm really going to say, and this is critical in the world that we're in, and especially in Israel, because I've been, I've been on with Zooms with therapists in different parts of the country in Israel. And I've learned a lesson and the lesson is when people's bodies are locked into anger and threat, you can't go to the philosophical big picture. You have to really talk about where they are. And they are in a state of threat and anger. And the therapist, so my message to the therapist was they have to create uh, opportunities to co-regulate their bodies or they can't be effective therapists. And this, and in a sense, like, for you, Rabbi, to be an effective, uh, literally a metaphor for a protective father or wise person, uh, uh, you have to not be angry, but you have your natural uh, repertoire is just so beautiful and inviting and co-regulatory that your presence just being there is helpful. Thank you. Thank you. It, but, it's, but it's absolutely true. And, and here, let, let me cut through it by May. The, so we understand that the neuroception, you know, whether we like it or not, is on high alert, aware there's a threat around us, is present, is real. And, and whether it's the threat, like I said, of terrorism, whereas the threat of anti-Semitism, we're feeling this threat. And like I think you said, we're projecting it. Mm -hmm. whether, again, whether we like it or not, that's not a deliberate act. That's an unconscious act. And someone else's neuroception or interoception is going to pick that up and yeah. so that well, gives both well i'm saying that that leads us to co-regulation here's my question to you we have 
like when we have the norms of calming ourselves, let's say breathing or somatic work or something, you know, we want to ground ourselves, bring ourselves down. You know, I'm not sure that's exactly where I want to be when there's real and present threat lurking mm. around the corner. So yeah, do you, have you, you, you don't that? want that. That's right. the critical point. You, in a sense, when there's real threat, your body is telling you to get out of there or protect yourself. And that's creates this uh, metabolic resource to fight or flee, which is really good, you know, for your survival, but not good for your co-regulatory skill set to calm others. So that's the critical point. And that's where you have, it's really total respect. And that's in a sense, what I, I was sensing going on in Israel was that there is uh, the anger is really what was being harnessed tremendous anger and anger i'm i'm not saying any of this isn't valid or real or 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 accurate or appropriate even certainly you can get angry this is horrible things that have been happening and you need to be protective or there is as a cascade of vulnerabilities that are beyond even wanting to talk about and that created a, literally a visceral a bodily motivation of survival and that is, you know, it's appropriate in certain contexts. So like it's appropriate um, if you are going to go off to war or going to combat, but maybe not even there because you still need to have your intellectual functions, your executive functions, and anger and fear disrupt those. So co-regulation becomes important even if you're using that energy to get into combat. The interesting part of including in the U.S. with our own interesting political uh, situation, which has some of the similarities with Israel, is that the political situation fosters a fear and anger motif. And what that does is make people feel more insecure, more about bodily self-protection, and less about others. And so their their ability to perceive others, to perceive things through the lens of other people's life becomes really restricted. And they only can see it through the immediacy of their own survival needs. And those survival needs are real. I'm not, I'm not minimizing those. I'm saying that somehow, and this is the Viktor Frankl model, somehow when you take the, the neuroception, the signal of threat, your body reacts to get this visceral interoceptive reaction but I process it. I don't, in a sense, ride it. See, I feel that people, many people who get angry take that physiological jolt as a, literally a jolt of energy to act out. Right. And I think politicians yeah. will yeah, use that. I think that's in the U.S. I mean, there's really kind of strange things going on here about what people are, are angry about relative to the real, uh, let's say, threats that are occurring in Israel. These are real things. So this is the part that you and I agree with, that we have neuroception. But in some situations, the neuroception is really accurate evaluation of the danger. That's right. But, and we need to retain that, not yeah. mitigate it. Yeah. I mean, that, well, that, those are let's, useful. Let's, let's play with that. You retain it if you're walking down streets. You That's try to right. mitigate it when you go into a a, a, a synagogue, a temple, a, a meeting place, or your home. And well, when those, things, yeah. even in our home, because sirens can go off, yeah. and we need to go into the safe room. So even in the home, yeah, you know, even when you go to sleep, your ear is like yeah. hurt. Is there a siren going off? It's really a tricky issue now to maintain some degree of that neuroception yeah. and keep it like relevant while at the same time regulating ourselves. It's really yeah, unusual. Well, let, let's kind of step back for a moment. And uh, you're basically asking for a formula that everyone could use. I want you to step back and say, not everyone can do it. Okay, let's start there. And well, not being easy. able to do it is really based on a combination of your history. Uh, and in Israel with transgenerational traumas, there's a lot of, let's say, lower thresholds to react. So we have to start understanding the vulnerability that we as an individual may have and try to understand that our reactions may be as if the world's ending or we have to protect our family, even though we may be in a so-called safe area. So the part 
that I'm really saying is not to make people feel guilty that they can't feel safe, but to yeah. realize an understanding of their own history and their own body uh, predisposes them to be more reactive, more protective. And there are a lot of benefits from, from that in terms of, let's say, evolutionary viewpoints. In a sense, they're more protective parents. Um, they you know, think about the future more than others. So you, it's not like it's all bad, that there's sure. there are many sure. products, like Country of Israel is a product of that. The educational sure. worldview, the view of, of the Jewish people as you know, education-oriented is part of that. Um, you can start seeing that the creativity, which is problem solving, to make, let's say, to expand um, outcomes with fewer resources, that's creativity. And uh, so we have to, I'm saying, start one by saying, yes, we react to this. And many people are going to react more than others. It's not wrong. It's more about their nervous system, not about their intentions. So we separate intentionality from biological reactivity. And we start lending that helping hand, the unevaluative trusting person. And some people can do that, uh, can be there. And it's, some people are Viktor Frankl. Many are not. Many are yeah. not. But if they have that capacity, I, I when I reread Viktor Frankl, so I read it in grad school, but then I read it after I developed polyvagal theory. Because when I was developing polyvagal theory, I was falling into this causal model that we could create a literally utopian world by having signals of safety. And what I realized is that you will never have uh, ubiquitous signals of safety. But what Frankel's book taught me or reinformed me is that even in the most dire situations, literally the angels show themselves. They're there. And you start getting this tremendous respect. And I start to use terms like super co-regulators, you know, that you meet people and you say they walk into the room and suddenly you feel like that. And I would say that the best week for many of us, like me, is to be an adequate one. You know, you're on the edge of super rabbi, so you have these features. You 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 come into a place and people feel it. And you walk into a few people uh, in your life that can do that, but not that many. And but the issue is meeting you is not making me feel uh, inadequate. I just have great respect. And I think that's part of what we have to learn to do, because I I do what I can do through the channels that work for me. You do what you do because you have this whole array of channels to express yourself. So kind of you. May I pull out a bit more? You know, you and I understand the terminology um, of uh, the neuroscience that you've taught us and brought the language to us, uh, co-regulation. Maybe, it, would it be okay if I ask you, given the fact we may have an audience who don't really know what we mean by co-regulation, you and I do understand, of course. Yeah. And you, could you share that with us and how people who have intergenerational trauma or the traumas from their own childhood who are now being triggered very much, mm. what kind of co-regulation, what should they be doing practically to use the principles of co-regulation so the principles of co-regulation are really derivative of the instinctive intuitive maternal child interactions or how we engage a a pet uh and that is through gentleness through intonation of our voice with prosody intonation where it's very melodic we don't yell yell has a vocalization that is aggressive our nervous system knows that Speaking in a monotone as uh, doesn't warm our hearts, but if when people's voices have mel melody, our nervous system starts to open up. So we live in a culture that believes the words carry the meaning. The words are, I wouldn't say they're irrelevant, but they're less relevant than the intonation, our voices. We are judging our body safety in proximity to another, not by the words, but by the intonation. So and we're so voice slowing the voice as we speak and lowering our voice you lower the loudest but the frequency oh. should be more melodic low frequencies can be booming and can be uh, they're like uh, volcanoes or earthquakes so we're wired we're literally wired to detect certain types of acoustic features as signals of life threat like a lion's roar or danger like if you step on the paw of a cat or a dog, 
they'll squeal and you look down. But if a lion roars, you run. And if a dog barks with a low bark, a low frequency, you're out of there. But if the bark is higher, you look to see, oh, lonely little dog. We, we're making rapid interpretations to that neuroception. So it's the frequency bands are important and then what you do within them. So if we think of classical music, Mozart is really the iconic model. And it's basically mother's lullabies. So he starts his opening movement with a mother's lullaby. And you're like the baby in the arms of a mother. You're feeling real relaxed. And he cleverly then gives the melody to instruments with lower and lower frequencies. And suddenly the room is filled and we're exploring and expanding our sensory world. So co-regulation is like a Mozart overture. Okay, So in a sense, uh, in fact, I view uh, the social engagement system, this ability to detect and to express these features as the preamble to attachment. So it's right. like, uh, so right. we're literally sending signals to another in psychological space that triggers in the other person's nervous system that we are safe enough to come close to. And I'll give you the reason why that works or where it came from. It comes from the fact that we're mammals and we're the only mammal with uh, a verbal language. You know, that, that's kind of like who we are, but we're not the only mammal that vocalizes. And the whole evolutionary survival basis for mammals was they could uh, connect and co-regulate it with each other and cooperate. And they use vocalizations because vocalizations were were basically broadcasting their physiological state. When they were in a sense a state of fear, the vocalizations got high. When they were in a state of anger, the vocalizations got lower and monotonic. And when they were safe, they became mid-range and melodic. So there's actually the code there. The code is there to calm uh, people. And what's interesting is if you got a uh, rescued cat or a dog or even a horse, you'd literally mother it with what's called infant-like speech. How do you deal with an infant? It's wired into us. The issue It's wired into mothers really well. Fathers sometimes forget it. And since you deal with families, you realize that fathers tend not to, um, they don't talk in the same way that mothers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So can we, I'm just thinking like this, that for our listeners who are finding, them, I'm, I'm guessing that most of our listeners, if not all, are finding this period of time one in which their nervous system is highly activated. They're feeling this stress and trauma response. Co-regulation can move backwards mm -hmm. internally to soften my own nervous mm -hmm. system, to calm me down. I wonder if you can comment about how that works, not just to co-regulate others, but doing that helps me. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. well I, the, the, to me, okay, there's no such thing as caregiving because that implies I'm doing something and not getting something back. When a caregiver is really effective, they don't burn out because they're getting so much back. And you can look at babies on mother's chest and you start seeing bodies conforming. They've given up the muscle tension of protection, both the mother and the father. So it looks like, okay, it looks like with humans that they can give each other warm hugs. Now, remember when you're in a state of threat and if you work with the trauma world, many people would like to give hugs, but their bodies just will not uh, soften up to do that because it's not intentional. It's part of their reflexive neuroception. So the intention is, yeah, I want to give a hug. The neuroception is proximity is dangerous. So sure. we, we can literally, by even observing our own body's reaction to giving someone a hug, we can tell where we are. We can tell whether we're accessible or not accessible. Absolutely. And the, and the the act of co-regulating those around us, mm -hmm. concentrating on helping everyone by speaking softer, more melodic, you know, the prosody, by focusing on bringing a less stressful interaction, more social interaction, social connectedness mm -hmm. is going to help me as well by me. Uh, so doing that yeah. for us, is that going to actually change me? 
Yeah, I call it social nourishment. And during the pandemic, this is what I all I had, you know, was Zoom. And and the issue is, yeah, I needed social interaction and you know, verbal interaction even on Zoom was better than nothing. But yeah, uh, that's that's part. There's another underlying part is co-regulation also has kind of a underlying respect that there's uh, symmetry in relationships. Yeah. And so it's not like uh, I'm giving and you're getting, I'm getting from you as well. And that dynamic interaction is extremely important. The other important element of what we're talking about is in the world of therapy or any type of healthcare provider, there's a lot of burnout. And a lot of the burnout is due to the fact that the therapists are not getting enough back from their clients in part because of uh, basically how, how healthcare is being provided. They're not having enough time. They're not having enough time to talk and interact with their patients. So burnout in, in the healthcare uh, portal is really about not getting adequate co-regulation from delivering the service. Okay, so the goal is at a time of stress to recognize that my nervous system, whether I like it or not, is going to do exactly what it's wired to do, which is to take me to fight or flight, to take yeah. me, hopefully not to freeze, to yeah. completely in that direction. And the goal is to get back to social engagement. Social mm -hmm. engagement, comment on just what, how you view, like when you think about the word social engagement, what are you thinking? Well, when I think about it, I think about a dynamically active face and listening and prosodic voice and an autonomic nervous system. That I is... have to explain that for our listeners. I'm sorry. I know what it means. But... Yeah. Okay. So look, our faces, when a person is scared, what happens to their face, especially the upper part of their face? Or if they have a trauma history, they have a flat face. Their face doesn't show exuberance or emotion. But the nerves that regulate the face, especially the upper part of the face around the eye, tell you when a person is is as engaged exuberant and interested we know that in terms of our social life but we really haven't literally unveiled the neural mechanisms of what's going on the nerves that regulate that also regulate nerves in our middle ear that enable us to hear what people are saying so that when our faces go flat we have trouble understanding what people are saying and so when you're scared you have difficulty processing what the instructions are and this is, of course, thing. happening. It's a real thing that when a yeah. person's scared, they may not actually be able to process well what they're yeah. hearing. Well, they hear something else. <laughs> yeah, they, but yeah. we all have yeah. experienced that where people yeah, have told us, yeah, right. told us that, you know, no, you didn't really say that. But the point is, that's what they heard and that's what they felt. And they're not going back to that. The point is, yes, our ability to extract what people are saying to see their facial expressivity, the intonation of their voice. It's all from a, a neural network of uh, of area of the brainstem that's linked to regulating our heart. And if we want to go even into biblical types of uh, references, like heart became uh, frozen, what were the terms of it? Uh, yeah, yeah that was right. And when that occurs, is when that there's no engagement, there's no empathy, there's no feeling for the other. And that's really the face and the voice have got as well, as well as the ability to hear what they're saying or process it. So in the state of even a slight elevation, we're already beginning to distance from social engagement. Yeah. The other is going to experience it. And then, of course, we'll, co we'll actually co-disregulate. You, you co-disregulate because it goes like this. Uh, you're in a room. And one person's vulnerable and they hear a signal and their physiology shifts and their face goes flat. And the person across the table from them who has a, let's say, a more regulated nervous system sees your face go flat. And now their face goes flat because they're seeing your face as if you're angry at them and they just don't know what's going on. So it's now a dangerous situation in their navigation of the social relationship. And you, who have been shifted by the the start of it says you blame it on the other person now you got validated now i know i'm threatened. right exactly <laughs> exactly and they'll never buy the fact that you just responded to them they just will never buy it because they're in the physiological state where their own proximity their own self is the critical 
uh, survival. That's what they, it's about me. It's not about us now. It's about me. And I think when our bodies get into this defense, it's, it's about me. It's, and it's hard to become back about us or even a larger us. It just becomes very difficult because that we were basically going back through our evolutionary history and giving up our sociality. When we get triggered into a state of threat, it's about me. Right. The, I think we once discussed this, you and I, that, you know, in the, uh, the, the literature of the rabbis, there's a line, Kamayim ponim al ponim kem leva adam. As water reflects back to you, yeah. so does the heart. Reflects yeah. back to you. And so you see a reflection in the water and, you know, whatever you're seeing tells you how you feel or you react yeah. to it. It's the heart of a person. Yeah, well, that's beautiful because that's neuro, that's both the social engagement system and neuroception um it's it's beautiful i i uh, i i totally agree it's the broad it, it, it is we 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 react to each other based upon what we're broadcasting and that is the warning here the awareness so the biblical statement is important because it's really saying that if i can be aware of what's going on inside me I can understand how those around me might be reacting. And now the question is, I have two options. One is to find the opportunity in the individual with whom I feel safe enough to kind of co-regulate, or I go into, let's say, uh, a solitude, a space of solitude, and basically meditate or pray and get back into my body. And when I feel more grounded, in a sense, more embodied is a, is a better word for me than grounded, then I can re-engage that world with greater sensitivity and respect for what it, what's going on. So this would be a time, historically, mm -hmm. when we all need to learn about co-regulation. It needs to become second nature to us to understand yeah. that if all in a in a circumstance of higher elevated anxiety potential stress and or trauma being reactivated yeah. Yeah. working on a regulation should become second nature to us yeah well the problem we are all going to find is people have difficulty finding others with whom they feel safe enough to uh, literally co-regulate and the answer to that there's a pragmatic answer and that is there are other social mammals that help out a lot pets dogs cats and horses and yeah. and you know i we now have a cat and the cat is really uh, lives a life of self-regulation it was not really that concerned about my feelings but it's concerned about her feelings and basically regulates her life of proximity of contact to en enable her to feel safe enough so she maintains proximity and then when she wants to be handled she comes close when she has enough she pulls away so you can actually watch the dynamics we've had dogs dogs are trying to please you they're kind of like children and yeah. what happens is that they give a lot more they have much uh, their repertoire of facial expressivity is and vocalizations and gestures are really very human oriented cats are less so cat faces doesn't really give you enough except when the ears go back you probably should watch out the the <laughs> issue is but, but the, the interesting part is dogs are so natural because if you don't engage them if you don't look at them or you talk with a monotone voice, even like this, and you lower it like that, the dog will basically go down to the ground as if they did something wrong. So right. so you can see they're picking up the same uh, cues through their neuroception that, we're, that we pick up. Excellent. Jochen, I wonder if this would be a good time if we could take any questions to, for Dr. Yeah. Gorgeous listeners. Yeah, yeah. We got, we got a... We got, we got a, there's a few questions that came in early on um, before the event. And then we have a few live ones here. So let me start with one of the live ones. This is an interesting one. This is a woman from Israel, obviously a mom. And she wrote, when I can't sleep at night in Israel and my mind reaches for appropriate places, I can hide my various age size children. If a threat in my neighborhood takes place, I consider this practical. While other things, others think I'm hysterical, I don't feel mm. hysterical or I'm realistic. I live a walking distance to a PA-run town. <clears throat> Just wondering if this is normal or is this my Holocaust survivor background kicking in and I need to calm down? Um, 
hopefully this question makes sense. So first of all, Esther, I think the question makes a lot of sense. Uh, but Dr. Porges, what are your what are your thoughts? Well, on that? okay. So if we shift and if we deconstruct what's being said, and then there's, there's a plan. There's in a sense, uh, it's not a hysteric plan. It's a rational plan. There's real threat. And so, no, it, it, and in doing that, in working the plan out, she's feeling safer herself. So you start seeing the the act of building a plan has a function, two functions. One, the real life uh, saving aspect of it. And the other one is how she feels at that moment of developing the plan. Yeah, and if I may add, if this makes sense, having a plan is a natural, healthy response. Obsessing about a plan may be where she needs to bring herself down and, 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 and somehow, you know, well, I know if co-regulate would be the right thing, but at least regulate herself, mm -hmm. being obsessed with yeah. it. Having it at all is natural and healthy. Yeah. Let me add something else. Our nervous system craves predictability. It's a metaphor for safety for our nervous system. So we anticipate, we know the answer, Therefore, it's predictable. So even when things are painful, predictability, uh, and since some people would stay with a painful situation if it's predictable, then go into an unpredictable situation. She's creating predictability in her mind. She's creating a, a psychological metaphor of safety by mapping that out. So I think she can use it to enable herself to feel better and to regulate her physiological state to calm down, calm herself by her own planning and her own actions. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, another, okay, and another question that came in earlier uh, when you were, when you uh, and Rabbi Russell were discussing the uh, co-regulation and voices relating to a mother and a child. Um, so, you know, I, and this is a broad question but I think it's important because certainly many of the participants that are part of the Fresh Start program, of course, they come here because they never had that. They never had that healthy attachment, if you will. So how does that come into play when there are attachment issues at a young age? Um, and then the other question is also when you have people either on the autistic spectrum or mm -hmm. people that have where physical touch has been a form of mm -hmm. abuse, of course, um, what what are they able to do or what guidance can you offer to them? Hmm. Well, let, let's separate the questions. So let's do the first one. Let's go one at a time. So can you re just repeat the first one again? The first one was relating to um, the voice and, and if somebody didn't have that oh, like, healthy you... attachment growing up. Okay. And again... Okay, there, the voice is wired into us. So even if you didn't have it, our nervous system still knows what it is. And what has really happened to people, and I think this is part of the, the trauma trajectory, is that the voice has been used and, and the outcomes have been violated. So the voice of the biological parent might have been prosodic. The child trusted the parent and then got violated by the parent. And I think that's the backstory of what that question is about. And the consequence of that type of attachment uh, trauma or childhood trauma is difficulty in trusting others and prosodic voices become now a trigger of potential threat. And that I think is really what the question is about. So if you have this history, your body's reluctant uh, to relinquish its defenses. And that uh, prosodic voice was the script that the nervous system has basically we, we evolved to have the script. So when we hear prosodic voices, our bodies become accessible. So the the basically that works out uh, with good trauma therapies, especially those that involve a degree of insights about the body, somatic oriented therapies. And the understanding of the history starts to change. And we've been working with people in terms of uh, where they start to, in a sense, get used to prosodic sounds and their bodies retune and they become very accessible to it. So the issue is uh, the person who, who asked the question is really asking about uh, a body that through a history, through their development, the history is more tuned to be in states of threat. 
And the answer to that is yes, that occurs. And when you're locked into states of threat, and now you have what's going on in Israel now, or what's going on, let's say, anti-Semitic issues in the U.S., the body is really highly reactive. And so the uh, this gets to the real issue is if you have a nervous system that has a history of not being co not being accessible to co-regulation through social interaction, you have to really get some help to work on those systems. And at the very least, see how you do with a, a pet that is, as says, uh, many people who have difficulty with proximity with humans do extraordinarily well with co-regulating with a dog or a cat. So I'm I'm not saying they're the same. I don't mean to minimize the importance of human interaction, nor do I want to minimize the importance of having, in a sense, a trusted pet. Yeah, I mean, I think the point you're making is that uh, that you can reprogram with help yeah. the initial nervous system reaction that identified that voice with a negative association. You can actually reprogram yeah. it. Yeah. Help, and that's the hope for everybody. Yeah, you, could do that. you know, you know, trauma is reversible. It may be slow, and you have to be patient. Part of the reason it's slow and you have to be patient is the nerve. Your nervous system is effective in protecting you and doesn't want to give up its defenses. And it's not saying give up your defenses. It's like saying to someone who's depressed, "Why are you depressed or grieving? Look, get over it. It doesn't work that way. When it's so deep into your foundational survival circuits, you have to literally lull it out. You have to, in a sense, uh, enable it to express itself. And I call these things, these processes, neural exercises, because you're really uh, recovering very ancient old circuits. Excellent. Okay, and then, oh, the and then, now, the follow-up question to that, which you may have answered a little bit, but maybe it's a little different, is, you know, relating to touch. And the individual mentioned either someone on the yeah. uh, autism spectrum disorder yeah. um, or, yeah. again, yeah. People that have experienced touch in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's the same. Yeah, I did touch on it because tactile hypersensitivity, and that is really what the person's describing, is a naturally occurring phenomenon in a body that's under a state of chronic threat. So the issue is I can't be touched because I have been inappropriately touched or injured. Um, so you develop these tactile hypersensitivities. So it's the body in a state of threat. And that is, in a sense, what we've been talking about with a good therapist. The body can literally learn to give up its defenses of uh, threat, being locked in threat. Now, in, in the same community that has tactile hypersensitivity and chronic threat, you find terms like chronic stress. You find terms like irritable bowel syndrome, uh, chronic pain, fibromyalgia bodies that are in chronic threat. Long COVID is another one. The body uh, won the battle, defeated the pathogen, but the nervous system literally didn't get the message. Oh, very well put. Thank you. Very well put. Yeah. Okay. On a, uh, so on a, on a practical level, and then we have other questions I'm going to bring up, but on a practical level, doctor, uh, a psychologist from New York asked, how do we learn more or get trained about the polyvagal theory to help reduce our trauma and stress? Hmm. Well, the first place to look is the Polyvagal Institute. So it's polyvagalinstituteoneword.org. And there's a new book that came out uh, called Our Polyvagal World, How Trauma and Safety Change Us. It's, I wrote it with my son, Seth. It's on Amazon. And that's that's accessible. That's, I would say, the first book that I have ever been involved in writing that that's readable. Um, it's readable. Totally readable. Man. Yeah, oh, totally readable. To well, amazing. Seth is, is my son is a journalist and also a filmmaker. And uh, he's just did a brilliant job working on it. So I was very pleased. No, it, it it's accessible. That's the magic word. And uh, being a scientist, um, accessibility is not what, what we are trained to be. This is like neuroception for dummies. It's it yes, we could visualize the book as a process like neuroception. Yeah, it's it's the infusion of polyvagal concepts in a stealth mode. I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
it's a, it's a you, short read. It's not a, you know, it's uh, yeah. seventy thousand words. It's not a real even long, long book. So even interception is clear. Yeah, everything's in there. Yeah, yeah. It, he and yeah. whatever I tried to change back, he fixed it back so it was readable. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so moving to some other questions that came in. Um, so and we, I'm trying to compile a few different questions but that I believe are essentially asking the same thing. Um, you know, therapists obviously have to maintain some level of separation <clears throat> while they, they're, they're, they're meant to be empathic and understanding. Um, this is causing a hard time for therapists, essentially. Um, you know, where their own emotions are at stake and are vulnerable and how do they, any thoughts for a therapist that's trying to be there for their client while they yeah. themselves are, are going through a similar journey? Yeah, I I talk to therapists uh, in Israel and they describe it in the South. That's where, the, where they, they're dealing with the trauma uh, uh, patients. And I also had talked in Turkey following the earthquake. And I want to make a big distinction between the earthquake. Uh, the earthquake, the and I've talked to therapists in Ukraine. And I'm going to talk about those three different examples of what I could offer. And then you can see what can be offered in this situation. In the Ukraine, the biggest lesson uh, I learned was when I talked to them, they came out of the bomb shelter to, to talk to me on in the internet. And I asked them what they were doing in the bomb shelter. And they said they were singing songs together. I said, what kind of songs? I said, patriotic songs. But then I deconstructed what they were doing, which was co-regulation, using that social engagement system, using vocalization, facial expressivity, engagement, and long exhalations. And that's what you do when you sing. So they were doing neural exercises of co-regulation and calming. It was a really wonderful example of what could be done uh, under, a, in a sense, a uh, persistent stressor. When I talked in Turkey, it was a single event earthquake. And that what they needed to know was their bodies, by experiencing that earthquake, had really been triggered into a state of, a state of threat. And they needed to get their bodies back into a state of regulation before they engaged their clients. When I talk to therapists in Israel, it's a different situation because it's not a single event. And this is our discussion really today. It's a persistent event, and so the body can't give up its defenses unless it's in certain situations, and that's where the therapists have to be smart and wise about understanding their own bodies and co-regulating with their own trusted colleagues. Going for that walk, don't do too many sessions in a row, co-regulate, interact, share, go for the walk. And walking, and I use the term walking, walking is important because the body needs to mobilize when it's when when threat is around. So when threat is around and you're walking and talking, it's actually easier on your body than sitting and talking. And you might even want to start thinking about uh, therapeutic or let's say clinical sessions in which you are walking with your client and mm -hmm. seeing if that works better. Uh, walking in nature or walking in a safe place because the body once we in basically demand of the client to sit down we're saying you have to give up your your mobilization fight flight system and they may not be ready to do that excellent i've actually done that yeah. many times taking someone out we've walked and talked and someone who is in high activated state and it worked beautifully so okay. yeah, I want that um, thank you. Another group of questions, and this is a loaded question. I do just want to point out before I forget, and, and Rabbi Russell, maybe you remember the exact story, but uh, for many people watching or listening, you may not know this, but Dr. Stephen Forges has tremendous yichus in our community as a distant relative of the famed Chafetz Chaim. Um, and I just this Shabbos, I read a story, I think it was in Rabbi Bischoff's new book, about the sensitivity that the Chafetz Chaim had relating to children and the tone of voice and how they're supposed uh -huh. to be to. I, I don't remember the details, but, but clearly, uh, Dr. Porges, uh, your ancestors, um, you know, set the stage for you to be sensitive to this. So I just wanted to 
mentioned that. Well, Ross. I don't remember offhand if you remember the story, but uh, just knowing that it's there. But so this leads to the next question. Uh, and again, I'm compiling a few different questions, but essentially our children. Um, and are there any practical exercises? But I want to divide this question into two because there are children that are in America. <clears throat> and for example, in Brooklyn, New York, two weeks ago, during um, uh, when kids were going home from school, at the end of the day, there was a helicopter over the Bar Park area, a police helicopter circling the size, of course, a tremendous show of, of, of the police all over the place. Um, so there's the there's the American version of our children feeling unsafe. And I don't want to I'm, I'm just throwing this out. Perhaps it's in a certain way, it's a little more devious because this, the, the lack of safety isn't obvious. We feel it, but it's not like there are rockets over our head. Then, of course, there's the children in Israel who are literally living with, you know, rockets flying over their head, having to run to bomb shelters, et cetera. Um, so my question is just, and this is essentially the question that came up from a few different people, is how can we help our children, both the children in America that are, I guess, ex experiencing secondary hmm. trauma, and then the children in Israel that are experiencing primary trauma? Any thoughts, ideas? You know, we've asked this question before to our other panelists, Dr. Bessel, Dr. Janina, Dr. Ken Adams, et cetera. Uh, and it never gets old. There's always a new twist, a new angle, a new perspective. So we definitely want to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. The, 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 the first word out of my mouth is we need to learn to be better witnesses of our children. And rather than trying to tell them and fix things, which is our reflexive need, we have to literally be more compassionate and listen to the child. And just by the term they would use in the clinical setting is support the space of the child or, or, the, or, the, or the client. And it's not easy. I mean, as, as a father and as a spouse, it's very hard to just sit there and listen. We want to fix. We want to in, literally intrude. So the first part is the child has feelings. And we want to be careful that we don't start telling the child what they're feeling and what it means. We want the child to be expressive and we want to acknowledge that we are listening to the child. And then we get into a dialogue of what the child's feelings may mean or what the sounds may mean. We try to increase the, uh, let's say, the sensitivity and complexity of that narrative, make, make a different meaning out of it. So what, where a meaning might be frightening of a helicopter, it can be nuanced through a discussion that it may be really protecting the one rather than yelling at the kid and say don't get scared it's there to protect you and that's insensitive we need to understand that those frequencies the sounds of a helicopter are a disruptor putting metal detectors in schools is certainly a signal of threat having people wear guns in public places to me is a signal because i didn't grow up with guns but when you go to israel you see that and you kind of like that's the way it is you know you kind of have a different viewpoint so, um, uh, in a sense, we need to understand the feelings of our children and listen to them. Okay, and and um, I, I, I guess that's assuming that we did everything that you discussed before, which is regulating ourselves. That's a, that's a prerequisite for all that. Um, and and then I guess you know, do we? Before you say it, if I could just add that the, when you say prerequisite, you know, it goes without saying that our children, it, everyone, every human being in the presence of another human being is observing whether you like it or not on a neurological level, their nervous system. It's just a fact. That's what we do. We're wired that way and we pick it up. There's no place you see this more than with children and their parents. Children learn about life, their programming, the actual pro the programming of their neural pathways occurs very, very much in context of their parents. So the primary, I think that would you agree with me, the primary focus, I think, for us as parents is to the extent that we're able to, because it's different for different people, but to the extent we're able to when we're around our children, to be conscious that we're actually 
in a certain way act. We're interacting with their nervous system that they are learning from us. When they observe us calm, but focused and attentive, mm. they will also be much, it'll be much easier for them to be calm, focused and attentive in a way if we control that, they will resonate to it. I think is a given, yes? Oh, well, it's a, a brilliant and succinct statement. And what was doing, I, I want to basically add to it, uh, many mothers and fathers too are highly anxious. And when their kids are distressed, they try to fix it. And they're basically not fixing it. They're actually exacerbating it because their bodies are in a state of threat. And they really need to be a better witness and calmer in the in the presence of their child. It's not easy if you are a highly anxious person because we can throw out the word anxiety in in the world of polyvagal, because within the polyvagal perspective, uh, anxiety is a body in a state of threat, and that's just being broadcast to the child. That's right. That's right. So the more we're aware of it, to the degree that we're able, because again, I want to repeat, it's different for different people yeah. based on their history and childhood and circumstances and personal experiences but if we're aware of that we're you know we're actually programming their yeah. nervous system while we're while they're observing us and it's a powerful tool that we can use to help our children yeah. i mentioned actually in the uh, when we started these podcasts that when this these web uh, webinars that when we first heard the sirens my children and grandchildren were here visiting yeah. from uh, america and a whole bunch of us when the siren went off, went into the, the the safe room. And it was in the safe room where I felt it was important to make a statement. And what I said to them all is we're not in this room because we're terrified. We are responsible, mature citizens who when we hear the siren, we go in the safe room. And if everyone who's responsible, mature does that, well, then there's less harm going to happen to all of us. Mm -hmm. But we're not here because we're terrified. And everyone calm down. Everyone calm down. And then we said a piece of Tehillim, one chapter of Tehillim together, of Psalms together, for whoever is being affected by this, that Hashem, you know, God, Hashem should help them. Mm. But we co-regulated, and it was visible in the room that everyone calmed. Yeah. Well, well it's I, not just they calm, they were co-regulating because they were looking at each other. They were, uh, uh, you were reading together, you're using all the structures that foster this feeling of connectedness. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yes, you're ver very much like uh, the Ukrainian therapists who were like singing in the bomb shelter. It's like you're, it's it's collective going on. I mean, they were when I saw them online, they were beatific, and I'm trying to figure this one out. They just come out of a bomb shelter, and I'm dealing with that. And you were doing a similar act of connectedness and. Uh, using all the right features, all the narrative, all the vocalization, everything is right. Thank you. So I would I would add, I would remind you, Dr. Porges, that in our some of the last discussions that we've had over the years, um, one of the beautiful things that you highlighted was Judaism's, um, I guess, focus on healing trauma. And you mentioned things as basic as shaking during davening and the body moving. And you talked about minion being together yeah with others and being in a group yeah. so you're not alone and i'm assuming even even things that we daven three times a day or that yeah. you know holidays it's like the predictability element yeah. so there's there's a lot obviously within yiddishkeit within within our religion but i do want to sort of wrap up with one last comment that somebody just came and i'm taking a risk here because i'm counting on both dr Porges and rabbi russell to take this comment and lift us up uh but somebody just messaged me saying so Going back to what we mentioned about the Holocaust, are we just doomed because of so much that we are carrying from the Holocaust for a couple thousand years, or are we able to to let go of that and obviously create hopefully a a, a better a better world and a better life and a better internal world for our children? Who wants to answer it first, <laughs> Doctor Porges? Would you oh, like? I don't. Okay, I, like... I'll I'll answer. Um, Okay, so first of all, I take a very optimistic perspective, and polyvagal theory is an optimistic perspective. It doesn't, it's not being doomed or a destiny view. It, it's really saying 
we can claim our evolutionary heritage. And what we're really saying is not merely our, our heritage as Jews, but our heritage as humans. And that heritage is that of creating safe environments for each other, supporting each other's sense of safety. Even though the world may have for millennia, in fact, always had these severe challenges in which threat cues have always been kind of uh, placed into our world and we under threat, we don't have the total access of who we really are. And so the game plan is we want to be safe enough to allow the brilliance and the love of what it is to be a human to express itself. And that's our, in a sense, our natural state. And so I have this very optimistic uh, viewpoint that once we understand how we can literally signal safety to our bodies, we can create the context that enable us to be who we really are. And I will also tell you what I'm working on now. I'm working on something that's called polyvagal music. And it's music that has embedded in the music the endogenous bodily rhythms. And what that really means is visualize yourself floating on a on a raft in an open sea, but not fearful of falling off the raft, being moved up and down, literally massaged by the movements of these slow rhythms of, of the waves. Well, we have those rhythms in our body. They regulate digestion, blood flow, they're there. But what happens under threat? Those rhythms get depressed and we start getting ill and we feel bad. What would our lives be like if we can literally port those rhythms back into our bodies? So going back to your point is when you daven, you do a lot of bowing and, and shifting. That is the rhythms of triggering blood flow or blood pressure changes. I just, And in fact, if you start it says decomposing the, the songs that are the chants or the songs within prayer, they also carry a rhythmicity that moves our bodily fluids along. And I decided I would just make it efficient and create music that did this. And so this, this will actually be available at the end of 2024. Well, well, well. Uh, if I could add my two, that's beautiful, by the way. If I just add my two cents. When I first witnessed a Wikipedia, I counted the expulsions of the Jews over the centuries. There were 71 of them recorded there, there may be more. But when I first saw it, it was like I shouted in horror, looking from Egypt and on to the Holocaust. But then when I looked at it again, a smile came on my face and it occurred to me, we must be arguably the most resilient people mm. that have ever existed on earth. That's us, our resilience is extraordinary. And I actually, when I first saw it, it was like, ah, you know, there was this nervous reaction. And then I got flooded with the power of resilience. And in fact, interestingly, if I could just finish Yechner with this thought and tie it back to polyvagal theory, you know, we in Israel, and in fact, the whole world, the Jewish world, we're talking the, the, about being together, helping, you know, deal with this crisis together, you know, in Hebrew, together we will be victorious. There's a sense of connection, achdus in Hebrew, of us being connected to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what polyvagal theory is yeah. really telling us at the heart of social connection. That connectedness is an incredible positive response that's happening in the Jewish world. And I guess my hope and prayer is that we retain it afterwards. Mm -hmm. that we don't go back to normal. But we learn the the lessons of connectedness, how crucial that is globally in a macro scale and in, in, in the micro scale in our own families and relationships that we connect with each other. And that's really the answer to the trauma and the terror yeah. is that we connect and have social engagement. There you go. We finished all the way back. How about that's that? That's right. That's beautiful. And I just want to, <clears throat> I want to bring up one other point, Dr. Borges. I know you're always curious. I don't feel like I'm teaching you, uh, telling you something. I know you're curious to learn. I'm not sure if you heard of a book called The Awakened Brain by Dr. Lisa Miller. No. She actually studied the science of spirituality. Um, and and in it, one of the, I bring it up only because one of the things that she talked about was the, the back of the head where the bump is. And she discussed some x-rays or MRIs, et cetera, related to that. And it just hit me how our film no. Oh. on a daily basis go there as well so i i just think as we discover hmm. as your work and other people's work lead we're, we're going to see a lot of the stuff tie in nicely 
tie in nicely together. Um, I do want to take this opportunity, though, to thank, of course, Rabbi Russell. Thanks for being with us again for, all the way from Israel. And um, Dr. Forges, thank you for being you. And like I said, it, it means the world to have leading voices in the mental health world. Uh, hold our hands uh, and be part of, as Rabbi Russell said, be part of our community. And of course, you are part of a community. You're uh, you're you're one of us, so that that means uh, that means the world to us. Um, so thank you again for being here. We will have a uh, uh, a few other webinars for all those still watching. Uh, we'll have Dr. Stuart Ablon. We'll bring on Dr. Dick Schwartz um, and Dr. Ron Siegel. Are you familiar with Ron Siegel from Harvard, the expert in mindfulness yeah. and meditation? No, but Dick Schwartz is a friend, so you'll okay. enjoy him. So, yeah, so Dick is going to join us in a few weeks together with Rabbi. Mm -hmm. Y.Y. Jacobson, uh, any uh, videos of all this are available either on YouTube, all our webinars are available mm -hmm. on YouTube, and of course on Spotify. And with that, just want to thank all of you again. Thank you everybody for joining us, for being with us today. Thank you, Rabbi Russell. Thank you, Dr. Porges. We should thank meet you. God on better occasions. Thank Steve, you. Steve, maybe we'll see each other for a good time if we can. Wonderful, wonderful. Keep in okay. touch, and thank you. Yes. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.